This is Duke University. You know, I think there are two strategies in, in terms of Donald Trump. One is uh, who emerges as sort of Trump light uh, as a sort of less bam, uh, bombastic, uh, divisive version of Donald Trump, maybe more of an, someone who has more of an establishment uh, credentials, somebody like uh, Ted Cruz. So that, I mean, I think that's one strategy you see uh, him trying to employ now. Uh, for instance, he doesn't agree with Donald Trump's ideas about what should happen with uh, Muslims coming into the country. Uh, and he he vaguely criticized him recently at a private fundraiser. And the other is just the complete anti-Trump, right? Somebody like Jeb Bush, somebody like Chris Christie, uh, somebody like all of those folks uh, who are below 4% uh, in the national polls. I mean, that's the real surprising thing here. Jeb Bush enters this race in Washington. Everybody thought uh, he was going to do so well. He raised $100 million, uh, and he just hasn't been able to catch on as the anti-Trump. And maybe someone who's between the Trump light and the anti-Trump is someone like Marco Rubio. Everybody likes to talk about uh, Marco Rubio, uh, and supposedly he's had something of a surge because he's been so uh, great in those debates. The problem is, if you look at uh, two things, one of which is his standing in the polls, it hasn't really improved that much. A state like New Hampshire, uh, it's actually down from October. He's lost two points uh, in that poll. And if you just look at organization state by state, he doesn't really have uh, much of an organization. I think his theory of the case is he'll win some state early on and emerge as the consensus choice, and then all the money uh, and infrastructure will come. This sort of idea that um, you know, if you are, if you just kind of do well, then everything else will follow. But the problem is the real uh, approach that somebody like Barack Obama has was. You know, if you build it, they'll come, right? You build your infrastructure, uh, you're smart on social media. And, and so I think that's the real uh, gap in terms of Marco Rubio's strategy. Um, it's just so hard to, 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 to think that he's going to catch on in the state and then catch on across the nation in terms of that infrastructure. You know, in, in some ways, glee, right? I mean, they, uh, in some ways, they think the situation that uh, Republicans are in now uh, is this manifestation of where Republicans have been over the last four years, even eight years, or even 12 to 15 years, which is uh, consistently moving to the right, uh, and in some ways, playing uh, with fire with some of the more divisive uh, talk around immigration reform, uh, particularly over these last uh, cycles. Uh, uh, and that Donald Trump is sort of a manifestation of all of this, if in some ways Republicans uh, use kind of dog whistle politics to stoke white fear and white grievance politics and identity politics, uh, then in some ways Donald Trump is using the regular whistle, right? He's not uh, hiding uh, some of this red rhetoric that very much uh, resonates with a certain uh, segment of the Republican Party, um, uh, mainly working class whites. But, but the thing is, he also does pretty well among co college educated uh, Republicans and the Chamber of Commerce types. Uh, so I think they are, you know, kind of sitting back and, and eating popcorn over this one uh, and, and uh, seeing that, you know, their interpretations is this is kind of a chickens coming home to roost uh, situation. But also, uh, they say in some ways, and I know Hillary Clinton was on air last night talking about this, uh, they also feel like it's dangerous in some ways, uh, kind of the feelings that it's stoking uh, between, uh, you know, among some people that this kind of div divisive talk just isn't good for the country. And you've heard Republicans say that too. It's anybody's game, I think, to, to a certain extent, uh, but I think it's really hard to make the case for Jeb Bush because he is cratering. Uh, he was at about 15% in uh, this summer, second to, Je uh, to, to Donald Trump. Now he's at 3%. The problem I think he has is he's tried everything, right? He spent $50 million on ads in, in early states. He said he could fix it. Uh, he thought uh, one of his uh, ways to appeal to folks was to talk about 
out his ties to Latinos, and none of that's really worked. And of, co of course, he also just isn't very good uh, debater. He's also just not a very good politician, right? He's not good at the great, you know, kind of big speech. He's not good on the debate stage. Uh, he's not good at the kind of retail backslapping that a lot of politicians uh, excel at, like Chris Christie. So I would, you know, I think it's going to be hard for Jeb Bush. I think somebody like Chris Christie looks really great. He's a fantastic, I think he's probably the best all-around politician in this race and certainly is making a bit of a comeback uh, in New Hampshire. I think he's got a good ch uh, chance. Um, you know, and, and then you just look, I mean, there's some of these folks who are just at 3 to 1%. Somebody like Kasich, uh, Rand Paul was supposed to have a breakout moment, but I think this focus on national security has really made that hard. So I think, you know, Chris Christie is going to be really interesting to look at, particularly uh, for when, when he comes out of New Hampshire, if he's able to have a decent showing there. Uh, I believe, you know, in December of 2011, I remember very well, uh, Newt Gingrich was leading in the polls, and he, and this was on uh, December 1st, 2011, he came out and said, listen, it's pretty clear that I'm going to be the nominee. I'm leading in all the polls. Of course I'm going to be the nominee, and that's a similar language that you see from Donald Trump. Back to 2004, you had Howard Dean uh, leading John Kerry, and really in the two weeks before Iowa, John Kerry was able to come back uh, and, and beat uh, Howard Dean, and we know what obviously happened. Howard Dean uh, didn't win. John Kerry did win the nomination, of course, didn't win the presidency. So anything can happen, and even with these external events, right? Who expected Paris? Who expected that horrible shooting uh, in California? And in some ways, that's shaken up the race, shaken up uh, what people want to talk about uh, in terms of making their case to the party. This is my third campaign because I did 2008, uh, 2012, and uh, 2016. I did a little bit in 2004, but yeah, this is great. This I didn't go to school for this uh, as an undergraduate at Duke. I was an anthropology major, but in some ways, you know, campaigns are about culture. It's about uh, the stories we like to tell about ourselves. It's about how we're experiencing uh, cultural moments and hi historical moments and whatever narratives about uh, the culture and the time and the place and the moment uh, we like to tell ourselves. And of course, that depends on who we are. Uh, so it's it's great. And, and, and this is my first time obviously working at a television uh, station. I was at newspapers before, but I'm able to write and be on television, which is a really great hybrid. Uh, it really speaks to the convergence of, of media. And, and, and so it's, it's been really great so far and you know it's only going to get more busy once the real campaign starts in 2016. No, that, that's true, and so I did. I, I was an anthropology major uh, at Duke and loved that. I mean, my, my freshman year, I decided to major in anthropology, and and, and, and uh, I, I feel like, you know, that major kind of helps me understand the moment better, understand culture, understand people, uh, and the stories they like to tell about themselves. So it's it's been a real a real good mix for me. I never would have thought I would have ended up doing journalism as an anthropology major, but here I am. Funny thing is, uh, Jeb Bush, because he's got so much money, has got uh, better state organizations. Uh, he's doing the kind of uh, groundwork uh, in in a place like New Hampshire, for instance, in a place like South Carolina. People think that um, Marco Rubio will do well in in. Uh, in Nevada, partly because there's a big Mormon population in Nevada, and, and Marco Ruby, of course, was Mormon at some point. Uh, so they think he'll do well there, but of course the thing about Nevada is it's a caucus, uh, and it's, it's kind of hard to organize. Um, Trump doesn't, doesn't have that great of organization, but he's got the bombast, and he's got, uh, you know, the, the ability to dominate the news cycle, and partly that's due to uh, our willingness to put him on our air because viewers like to see him. Uh, ben Carson has a decent organization in Iowa. I think it's kind of a state-to-state -state contest. Uh, do people, and then I think Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz has got great organization uh, in, in Iowa, but also in these southern states that are going to make up that SEC primary come March 1st. I mean, the thing about this, people have got money. 
Uh, they've got time. They've got opportunity because of the way this thing is structured. It's very front-loaded. It's proportional uh, allegation, uh, allocation of delegates. I mean, some of this stuff gets in the weeds, but this is why you hear people talking about that brokered convention. You know, sure, you know, we could be doing more. You know, I think the the news media is so broad, right? It's not just CNN. It's not just the, the big papers or the big, big networks anymore. It's, uh, it's everywhere, and it's everything you want to hear and read about. So if you want to dig into uh, Donald Trump's tax policy, such as it is, uh, you can do that. You can go on Vox. You can go on Wonk Blog. We've written about it at CNN Money. Also, you know, I think because it's there's there's just an endless you know um, appetite, but also just bandwidth for this stuff. It's not like you only have the morning paper, or you only have the thirty uh, minute uh, broadcast on NBC News. So I, you know, I think we're doing a pretty good job. I know we've taken a lot of uh, criticism and, and a lot of heat for um, almost blame for the Donald Trump phenomena, but. People want to hear from Donald Trump, and uh, you know we put him on our air. It, listen, I think he has definitely shaped where the the race is going, but I just also think uh, the nature of the uh, soon to be post Obama Democratic Party is has shaped the race as well. She was on a very different side of a lot of these issues in in, in two thousand eight, but Obama was too, uh, and and the party has become much uh, more progressive in these last eight years and embracing some of the identity politics, whether it's like Black Lives Matter uh, or criminal justice reform. Uh, the push for same-sex marriage uh, that wasn't happening in, in 2008. And I do think you can t tell in in certain very specific ways. Uh, Clinton has been pushed to the left by Bernie Sanders. Her uh, coming out against uh, the TPP that was clearly about Bernie Sanders and 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 wrapping up union and big labor support, which she's been able to do. Uh, you, you know, I think the problem with Bernie Sanders is he himself uh, wasn't as familiar with the Democratic Party as he should have been, and I'm already speaking about him in the past, and I shouldn't, uh, but he has kind of, I think, plateaued at about 30% in some of these polls. Um, but he didn't realize himself how diverse the party was. So he himself has come to a lot of these issues around identity politics, around criminal justice form, are really, really late. Uh, and, and, and really, I think that has been to his detriment because he's very much playing catch up on these issues, whereas uh, Clinton has some fluency in them because she ran in 2008 and because a lot of her, of her husband's con constituency uh, was that kind of new Democratic Party uh, where African Americans and Latinos are really the difference. Well, I think one of the things you one of the things you you see almost immediately uh, from the Clinton campaign and uh, Sanders campaign and O'Malley. We didn't talk about O'Malley, I guess, because he's only at one percent uh, in the polls. But they immediately uh, have to sh have to embrace these uh, issues and these causes. Uh, Hillary Clinton right away was was tweeting about what had happened uh, at Missouri, standing on the side of students. Uh, one of her top campaign advisors is from Missouri. He was tweeting about it. She retweeted it. Uh, I think uh, it's been challenging, I think probably more challenging for Bernie Sanders to figure out what uh, what Black Lives Matter is all about because he's from a very white state uh, in, in Vermont. Hillary Clinton uh, has had her own troubles when she went down to Atlanta, the Black Lives Matter a protester, you know, very much shouting her down. Uh, and she she had the old guard there, right? People like John Lewis, people like Kasim Arid, who are part of uh, the civil rights kind of establishment and, and, and official establishment, um, kind of had her back. But there is this new, very uh, unpredictable, uh, rambunctious crowd, like most social justice movements are, very much pressing uh, these candidates uh, to talk about these issues, to embrace these issues. You know, I think the issue in Chicago with Rahm Emanuel and Laquan uh, McDonald, very, very different difficult, not only for Obama, uh, we of course remember that Rahm Emanuel was Obama's chief of staff, uh, and, and, and very tight with the Clintons as well, which is why he was Obama's uh, chief of staff, because he's just a, a figure in the Democratic Party. You see the protesters there, they are calling for his removal, his resignation, 
Rom being Rom, he'll probably uh, not do that. But Hillary Clinton has essentially come out and said, "Listen, they feel like uh, that they feel confident that this is something that Rom can handle, that he can regain the trust of the people there." But again, this puts her on a different side than where those protesters are. Uh, I, you know, and I was talking to her people uh, yesterday. I was like, you know, this seems like an untenable situation for her uh, at this point. They point out, well, she's been a little tough because she was first to say that uh, there needed to be a DOJ investigation, and then you saw Rom come out later. But that's going to be really interesting to watch to see what happens out of Chicago. I think all of these folks are certainly trying. They're trying to do it on social media. They're trying to do it on Twitter. Uh, they're trying to do it on Facebook. I think what the situation you have, particularly I think with, with somebody like Hillary Clinton, uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement and, and just young people in general uh, is I, I do think there is a, a degree of disappointment with where uh, folks ended up with Obama. You know, Obama was very much a youth movement. He was this cool guy. He had the posters. He was on the cover of Vibe. Uh, and then you fast forward seven years and it's sort of like, well, uh, what did it get us in, in some ways? Uh, and he certainly uh, didn't necessarily want to embrace a lot of these issues uh, very um, strongly in his first term. He's picked up some of them in his last term, in his last uh, months. Uh, so I think it, it's a real challenge because uh, you had this candidate in Obama who was cool, right? And it was hip and it was trendy to be an Obama supporter. And, and now you have these other candidates uh, who are trying to reach out in a similar way to these voters. Uh, and we all know that when you try to be cool and you try to reach out to people, especially when you're older, uh, it, it doesn't work out very well, right? Uh, trying to be cool is the first sign that you're not very cool. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're very much trying. And, and Clinton, I know, has hired a lot of uh, younger folks who are very in tune with what goes on on Twitter, and they're going back and forth with a lot of the folks on, on Twitter. So, you know, it, it's very much an effort that, that she's making, and they go on. I think she was on Seth Meyers recently. Uh, and then on, on the flip side, uh, with Republicans, and, you know, Republicans have always, obviously always struggled uh, to connect with young folks, and I think the, the person who's trying to do it most of all is Marco Rubio, just by saying, you know, you know, flashing that million dollar smile. He's had videos where he's like tossing a football, uh, talking about hip hop, things like that. I mean, absolutely. Um, Donald Trump is the king of Twitter, right? I mean, he, uh, he responds on Twitter. He can set a whole, a whole news cycle uh, just with a single tweet, and then you have other candidates, uh, you know, responding to him in in, in kind or, or in not so in kind. And then somebody like um, Ben Carson has really mastered Facebook. He uh, has five to six million folks who follow him on Facebook. He posts a lot of his messages straight to his followers there. That's a very different crowd than the folks who are on Twitter. Uh, they tend to be, he, he's got a crowd, uh, a lot of women, a lot of homeschoolers. They very much feel an attachment to him uh, and feel like, uh, you know, his messages can go right into the bloodstream uh, by posting on Facebook. And in that way, they can go around traditional media as well. CNN, a lot of us uh, tweet a bunch. I used to be the Washington Post, a lot of tweeting there. Um, but, you know, Twitter is can be a little dangerous. I know uh, some of the powers that be here, uh, some of them really push for us to tweet. Others say, listen, if you don't want to do it, uh, you don't have to do it because it can be dangerous. People have gotten fired over tweets. Uh, and, and so but I try to use it as much as I can. I'm, I'm off and on with it. Um, I post my stories to, to Facebook. You um, you know, I think every election it's like some new technology. It's the television election. Uh, you know, it's the Twitter election. It's the Facebook election. Maybe this time it's it's the uh, Facebook election or the Twitter election. I think people thought it was going to be the Meerkat election at some point, and then Meerkat kind of uh, collapsed. Uh, but you know, it's seen, and we're obviously uh, we've really r ramped up our digital coverage and trying to, how do you uh, merge the television platform with the digital platform? People are getting uh, most of their news on their phones, particularly young people. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I mean, this, I am not the most digitally savvy or tech, you know, tech savvy person. Uh, 
um, but I do try to have a presence on, on social media, sometimes just as a lurker. <laughs> that's really um, that's really different about this campaign is that there's so many candidates right uh, and so there are times when it's like okay uh, Ben Carson is high in the poll so my editor will come over and say listen we want you to focus on Ben Carson uh, now because he's hot and he's at 26 percent in the polls uh, two weeks ago as Ben Carson was cratering in the polls my editor came over and said listen maybe you should focus on Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz because they're up and coming so you know this this has been like no other cycle because there's so many candidates you've got to figure out uh, who should you cover I wrote a story about Jeb Bush last week when he was at three percent in the polls and it was, you know, uh, you know. In, in some ways, I've talked to my editors about maybe we should just write one final story on some of these candidates that sort of buries them, right? Uh, because they're, you know, some of these candidates are so low in the polls, uh, but then something else happens. You know, maybe Jeb Bush will have a breakout moment in the debate. Maybe he'll have some shakeup in his campaign. Uh, maybe the much uh, heralded potential of Marco Rubio doesn't really materialize. So, you know, there are not many arguments. I, you know, they're kind of discussions face to face with your editor. Maybe you go back and you talk to your reporter friends and you say, "Oh God, my editor." You know, but uh, but but we're churning out so many stories um, that that you know, in a lot of ways, it's best just to say, "Okay, this is the fo this is the focus today." If that changes, you know, two or three days from now, that's fine. And I think the expectation uh, is that you're very familiar, uh, pretty deeply familiar with any number of these candidates and prepared to write something pretty quickly on any given day about any of them. On the Republican side, uh, you know, I hate to make predictions, so maybe I'll just say Pataki because he's barely in this race to begin with. Um, but, you know, this thing is going to go for a while. People are going to see opportunities because they've got so much money, and the way this thing is structured is that you could go into the convention and have people, you know, essentially tied. And, and so that's why, they're, again, like I said, there's a talk of the brokered convention, so stay tuned. Produced by Duke University.